thank you, Josh and Wendy. Uh, if you have questions, just line up near the mics. And um, so without further ado, uh, the next person who's going to come and talk is someone who's a security industry veteran. He was leading the InfoSec team at VMware and is now an engineering director at Netflix. Um, please welcome Jason Chan. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me in, and thanks, Facebook, for get oriented here, um, for hosting this event. So I want to talk about uh, kind of general abuse. And uh, so I think the one thing that everybody in the room has in common is we all, we all care a lot about protecting our users and, and operating safe platforms. Uh, so Netflix, as a subscription service, we experience abuse problems that are probably a little bit different than, for example, a free consumer service or a, an ad-supported service. So that's what I figured I would focus on today and provide more of a, like a business-focused view on abuse, um, both from the adversary side as well as the Netflix side. So we'll talk about things like why does abuse exist on Netflix, uh, how do we detect it, how do we control it, all the way through to how do we disrupt the monetization of abuse. Um, so just real briefly, Netflix is basically a streaming video provider. We take TV and movies and we send it to you over the internet. Uh, pretty much watch it on any device you want that's connected to the internet. Uh, no ads, uh, so one subscription price, so watch all you want. And what we have historically done is primarily redistribute content from other producers, but what we've done in the last few years is we produced a bunch of our own original content. So House of Cards, for example, was an or early original it's pretty popular, won some Emmys, um, Orange is the New Black, and then uh, one of my recent favorites, Stranger Things. So go check those out. <laughs> Watch for season two next year. Um, so a little bit about the size of Netflix, uh, the business. So we're about 86 million members in a, in a little over 190 countries. And uh, those folks watch about 125 million hours a day, uh, if you can believe that. Um, so at the peak time of our use in the U.S., about 35% of the Internet traffic in the U.S. is actually Netflix streaming traffic. Uh, so this is my team, Cloud Security. That's the team I lead. Uh, we, we work on all kinds of fun security problems like product and AppSec, uh, privacy, risk, corporate information security. We also work on some of the fraud and abuse engineering we'll talk about today. Just a little bit of background. I think every service, there's... Things about any given service that make fighting abuse a little bit easier, and then there's some stuff that makes things a little bit more difficult. So that's what I want to talk about. So this first column is simplifiers, or, or maybe in another word, uh, the things that I'm glad I don't have to worry about. Um, so first is uh, there's no user-generated content. Um, so yeah, UGC is a really, really difficult problem that we don't have to deal with. Uh, there's no ads on the service, so that's another channel that we don't worry about. Um, there's very limited member-to-member -member interactions, so there's not a, that whole spam channel doesn't really exist. And then there's no directly extractable value from a Netflix account. So on the more complicated side, while there's no extractable value, there is use value of an account, meaning if I were to steal somebody's account, I can actually use it for what its purpose is, which is, of course, to stream uh, videos. And that, that goes in well with the next item, which is fungibility of accounts. So any given Netflix account is kind of interchangeable for any other one. It's not like, for example, a bank account that has a million dollars in it versus one with zero dollars in it or a different Facebook account. So that really drives a lot of abuse patterns that we see. Uh, and then there's the device ecosystem. Uh, most people, when you think about device support, you think about browsers, you think about iOS, Android. So Netflix, actually, we support several thousand devices. Everything from gaming consoles and, and your cable set-top box to smart TVs and game, uh, gaming consoles. And so it's, it becomes quite difficult when you think about legacy support and you think about anti-abuse engineering and how the client plays into that. Uh, it's, it can be a little bit restrictive in terms of what you can implement. Uh, language diversity. So as earlier this year, January, we basically pushed out the service to most countries. So there's a lot of different languages to deal with. Uh, payments complexity, tons of different payment methods. Uh, and then the last one, which is probably the most unique to Netflix, which I am just generically calling usage patterns, which I think is uh, best uh, summed up in this commercial um, that we had a couple years ago, this Netflix commercial. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, basically it was a woman. She's kind of making her way through the airport. She's a little bit sad, a little bit down. And then this guy is chasing her down. He's, he's desperately trying to catch up with her. He finally does, and uh, you know her face kind of lights up when she sees him. 
and he says, hey, I need to ask you a question. And you know, you think there's gonna be a big romantic event and he's gonna propose. But he says, no, what's the Netflix password? <laughs> so um, this, is, this is one of the real big differentiators for our service, is that when you think about how when you watch TV, a lot of times you do that with somebody else. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a differentiator. So for example, if I'm gonna look at my LinkedIn emails, I'm probably not gonna invite friends over to do that. So that's more of a one-on-one -on -one scenario. <laughs> So this, this definitely influences abuse and abuse detection, the idea of that multiple people using a single account. So the Netflix service, what we really try to do, uh, this is really part of the core value of the service, really what all of us as employees work on is making it a very consumer-friendly service. And one important aspect of that is we have a 30-day free trial. So anybody can go in, if you haven't used it before, go in and kick the tires, install it on a device or two, watch some content, and hopefully you like it. And if you like it, then you'll convert to a paid member. If not, no big deal. Just go in and cancel. It's one button. You don't have to call customer support, nothing like that. Um, and as we know, folks who, who build consumer services, that when you, a lot of times when you're building a, a great consumer experience, there's some potential for abuse. And that's what, we, that's what we think about. And at a business level, when we think about you know, beyond just protecting our members, why do we care about anti-abuse on the platform? There's, there's really two main questions. The first one is which customers or how many customers are gonna convert from that free trial state to paid? Um, and we, you think about projecting your financial numbers and just your overall business. So if a segment of that free trial population are basically fraudulent accounts or fake accounts and are, have no intention of converting, that causes problems in terms of data. And then the next related question is we want to know, like many services, Netflix is heavily personalized. We care about how people use the service. It goes into how the UI works and what kind of content we end up buying. So we want to understand how members actually behave, not how people who are sort of exploiting various aspects behave. So we want to be able to clean up the data. In terms of how our adversaries work, it's actually pretty simple. Um, their, main, their goal is really quite very simple. It's to obtain Netflix accounts, but they do want to do so without paying. And the reason why they want to do that is also equally simple. They want to monetize those accounts. And they want to do it primarily via resale, meaning they're going to find somebody who's willing to buy a, a stolen or fraudulently created account. Or they'll secondarily use the idea of getting free Netflix as some kind of lure or bait for, for spam or spyware or malware or something like that. The methods of how they get these accounts, uh, two, two main ways. So one is fake account creation. What we call internally, we call that free trial fraud. That's just creating an account with no intent to actually convert to paying. Uh, you just want to exploit that free trial period. And then account takeover or, or ATO. So we'll talk about free trial fraud first. Uh, that's a lot of uh, alliteration there. Um, so. For us, again, a difference, a difference between Netflix and many other consumer services, it's, it, is a pay, it is a paid service. So payments is really a big differentiator. Uh, it is required at sign up. So even if you're going to create a fake account, you still need to provide a credit card, a PayPal account, something like that. And if anybody here has worked on payments, um, especially global payments, it's a very, very complicated system. There's lots of players, there's lots of networks. Um, and if there's one rule about complex systems, it's that there's always something going wrong. There's always a problem, uh, guaranteed. There's loopholes, there's weird processing things that are happening, all kinds of bizarre failure modes um, that are happening. And that's really what adversaries are looking for. So what that boils down to for us is that fake account management and controlling free trial fraud, it's really a payments fraud issue. So that's really how we think about it and how we work against it. So our, our general approach to controlling free trial fraud, I'm gonna split up into three areas. You can think about, uh, you know, as somebody comes onto the site, they go through the sign up flow and then they become a member and they start using it. So that first stage, we'll just call it initial assessment. We do things like uh, VPN analysis, proxy analysis. As you can imagine, signups coming from VPNs and proxies are you know, a little bit more at risk to being fraudulent. Uh, we do things like device fingerprinting. Uh, we, we also do data sharing with other global merchants to understand, hey, have these other merchants seen problems from these IP addresses from these devices? And then we also have our own internal threat intelligence about how things have behaved previously that will sort of bring to bear in that case. Uh, then you go from there, you're on the site, you're signing up, and now we want to validate the payment. 
So we do various method of payment checks. Uh, we have business rules that we look at to determine whether or not this particular device or this email address or this method of payment is actually eligible for a free trial. And then we do uh, risk-dependent auth. So you can kind of think about $0 auth versus non-zero dollar auth. If, if you're familiar with sort of credit card processing, we'll decide what to do there based on how risky we think a particular transaction, between a uh, particular sign-up is. So at that point, a, an account has been created if you've gotten through there. So obviously, we try to control as much as we can in those initial phases. But if things get through, as we know, fraud systems are not perfect. Uh, you get through, and then basically you have an account. And then what we rely on there is what we would call post signup analysis. A few different things. Uh, one of the real key ones for us is BIN anomalies. Uh, so a BIN is a bank identification number. That's kind of the, the first few digits of your credit card number. And within that number is encoded a bunch of information about who the issuing bank is, what geography it is, what kind of product it is, like a, a prepaid card versus a, a premium card. And when we talk about bin anomalies, um, the nature of the, the ecosystem is that there's been a lot of acquisitions and mergers. A lot of these different products have different authorization schemes and authentication schemes. And these are where pro the problems happen. So if we were to look at a population of valid accounts, you would expect a reasonable distribution across various bins. When we see bin anomalies, meaning we see a particular bin spike up in terms of new signups, what that almost always means is that there's some kind of uh, payment validation problem happening with that particular bank. So we'll then use that to sort of dive in. Uh, there's also CS contacts or customer service contacts. So you can think about if somebody, if you had your credit card stolen and then somebody used that account to sign up for Netflix, you now have unauthorized charges. Um, and then account behavior. So uh, we look at how does a regular account behave versus how does an account that was created for free trial behave. And one of the real, I just put an example here, a real key indicator for us is uh, cross-border streaming. So for example, a, an account gets created in say Finland and then when they start using the account, they actually start streaming in Canada. So not that that can't happen, but a lot of times what that means is that there's some kind of payment issue has been identified in Finland, and then they actually, so they create the account there and then resell it or reuse it uh, outside, of a, outside of that geography. Our objectives, pretty simple. We want to, within that first 30 days, we want to detect it and disable it. Um, so once you get past 30 days, then we're actually charging a card or charging some method of payment, a, payment, a PayPal account. And if we do that incorrectly, that leads to a, another series of problems for, for customers or potentially even people who aren't customers. Oops. And then what we want to do is just keep shrinking that window of the detected disable for a couple of reasons. We have mentioned keeping the data clean. And then we also want to reduce the adversary's opportunity to actually make money off of that. So that's our general approach to free, free trial fraud. That's the first kind of bucket of, uh, of abuse. The second one is account takeover. So I'm sure many folks deal with account takeover. It's a pretty common problem. I won't uh, be too specific with definitions here, but what we're, when we say account takeover, we just mean somebody who is not you has access to your account, typically has access to your username and password. The causes for account takeover are, are, are fairly common. Uh, so third-party data breaches, uh, you can imagine if there's a bunch of usernames and passwords out there, we know that people a lot of times will reuse their passwords. So if your password was compromised somewhere else and published, you know, if you use that on Netflix, then your Netflix account could also have problems. Uh, of course, people get phished, uh, people get malware. Uh, what we call friendly compromise is, uh, I mentioned account sharing. So you could, you could think about if you had a roommate, you had an ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend that you shared your Netflix account with, and then, you know, for whatever reason that relationship ends, they still have access to your Netflix account. Um, so the life cycle for account takeover, we look at this, we'll split it up into three different areas. The first one is, is compromise, the first kind of phase. Uh, regardless of how it happened, what, what ends up, what, what the result is, is that an adversary, a bad guy, has your credentials. What they typically do is one of a few different things. They'll use the credentials, meaning they'll just watch Netflix. Uh, they may publish those credentials on something like Pastebin or some other site like that. They may try to sell them, and we're going to talk about the monetization piece a little bit later. Or they may actually change your password, which could potentially lock you out. From there, we, we think about what is the member impact. So members, they may be unable to access their account because you know, they've been logged out, the email has been changed, the password has been changed. They may notice unusual activity. 
This is one we see a lot. They're like, hey, I don't remember watching that movie, but all of a sudden it showed up in my viewing history. Um, and then they may actually get a password reset. So if we have detected the account's been compromised, we may send that account through our reset flow, and then they'll get a reset um, so that they can reestablish control. And that leads to the final step of account takeover, and that's the resolution. So ideally, customers will be able to resolve themselves. We'll provide them the tools to do it. Uh, they may contact customer support for assistance. Uh, and then hopefully what, the, what doesn't happen, if they feel the experience is bad enough or they become frustrated, they may actually cancel the account. And what we seek to do is really across all those different phases, detect what's happening, take action where we can, and then measure the overall problem. I'll talk a little bit about account takeover. There's a variety of ways that you can detect if an account's been taken over or, or what's happening. Uh, one of the key things that we do is uh, we call it traffic analysis uh, for account validators. Uh, so OWASP has this generic term that they call credential stuffing. So this is not brute forcing of accounts, it's when you have a long list of credentials of usernames and passwords and you're going to test those against the service to see if they actually work. So we have a number of mechanisms where we can detect this kind of traffic coming in. We do a lot of uh, discovery ourselves for, for credential dumps, things on Pastebin, all kinds of, there's all, all, any number of sites out there that, that are listing people's email addresses and passwords. We also work with uh, third party partners to help us with that as well. Um, customer service contacts, so when somebody calls in customer service and tells us their, their account's been compromised. And then also predictive models. As you would expect, uh, none of these are perfect. Uh, adversary doesn't actually let you know that they've taken over your account, so we need to figure out other ways to estimate that problem. Uh, and that's where we get into uh, modeling account takeover, and certainly this is, it can be its own kind of real deep dive, so I'm just gonna cover this at a high level. Um, what we wanted to do to better identify what is the overall population that is actually impacted by account takeover. What we did was we started with credential dumps and just, uh, just a little bit of definition of credential dumps, I think I skipped over that. So there's various sites like Pastebin where people will just post email addresses and passwords out there. We call that a credential dump. Um, and they may be sourced from a bunch of different ways but at the end of the day, your username and password is somewhere on the internet. So our hypothesis was that if you were in this credential dump and you contacted customer service to, to, have, uh, to basically help manage your account, then it's highly likely that your account uh, exhibited pretty acute signs of compromise or takeover. So that was a kind of starting point. And what we did was sort of built on that to identify those accounts, segregate those accounts, and identify what kind of features were common to those accounts. So I think we ended up with a, a pretty long list of features, like 50 or so that were um, reasonably um, accurate in terms of identifying these accounts. So uh, one example is uh, for folks, people with Netflix accounts, one, one behavior that you almost never do with a Netflix account is log out of your Netflix account, which is a good thing for us. Um, but what we notice is with account takeover, those accounts actually exhibit quite high log out behavior. So we went from there, we applied it to the broader uh, population and then have kind of iterated on that with other revisions and models. Uh, so that's, so there's free trial fraud, there's account takeover, now you have a pool of Netflix accounts and now you're, you're the adversary, you wanna make money off of that, how are you gonna do that? Um, so I'm gonna split this into two main areas. One I'm just gonna call the general internet and then we'll talk about the dark web. So everybody knows the, uh, the key to sales, right? The key to sales, you have to have marketing, right? So if I have Netflix accounts to sell, sell I need to let people know about them. So that's one of the things that we deal with a lot. Uh, there's all kinds of video channels. So this is a YouTube video, how to get a free premium Netflix account. Uh, Vimeo doesn't want to be left out. That's also used as a platform for this kind of uh, marketing. Social networking is a really popular one. Uh, Twitter user here selling not only premium Netflix accounts, but also they have a lifetime warranty. Um, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, then you can actually just go right to an auction or forum itself and sell. Of course, eBay is quite popular. There's also regional uh, marketplaces like uh, Mercado Libre in, in uh, Latin America and South America. Uh, and then there's also just general forums. Here's another uh, nice merchant here who's also offering a warranty. Um, so the outcomes for these customers, um, there's typically two things that happen to people who sort of follow this and actually get an account this way. Uh, the first one, you might, have, you might have seen this from one of the earlier screenshots. 
Uh, a lot of times these merchants who are reselling, they tell the people don't change the password for the warranty. And basically what's going on is they're trying to sell a, a, a single compromised account to multiple people. And basically what happens, the warranty kicks in is if something happens and that user regains control or that free trial runs out, they'll just send you a new username and password. So that's how the warranty works. So that's kind of, if you, I guess if you're uh, okay with that uh, service model, then this um, it may be a reasonable way to save a few dollars a month. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the other primary outcome for people who do this, uh, does this look like legitimate software there? Um, we, we deal with this a lot. This is a Netflix account generator. Um, so this is some software that you're going to need to install to get a Netflix account. I mean, it's not the Netflix application. Um, so there may or may not actually be accounts associated with this, but the, the next step, if you're going to click generate here, is you're going to get malware or spyware, adware. You're going to click through some, some scam or spam that you're going to have to deal with, and it's probably not going to be a great uh, outcome. So that's the problem. That's kind of the, what we deal with in terms of disrupting the monetization. So there's a bunch of stuff we do earlier on to try to prevent all that. We talked about uh, the free trial fraud and detecting account takeover. So once those accounts are out there in the wild, they're being monetized. What we also try to do is disrupt what's going on there. Uh, the monetization controls, uh, we do a lot of discovery and takedown. So we actually open sourced the system a couple years ago called Scumbler. And what Scumbler does is go out and try to find these kinds of things for us. We also use uh, uh, vendors to help us with the, actually going out and finding these things and taking them down. Complicated by language, just if you can think about, I now need to search for free Netflix accounts in you know 50 different languages versus just English. Um, and then the collaboration, more and more what we're trying to do. Uh, so eBay, for example, has a couple of programs that we participate in. So instead of finding the auction and taking it down, they'll just prevent it from getting there in the first place. And then increasing what we're doing. So we're a pretty big user of Thread Exchange, and what we're increasingly trying to do is use Thread Exchange. It's kind of work in progress, but as a mechanism for exchanging information around account takeover. Um, so then the last thing I wanted to cover was just the dark web. Uh, so if you're, not, if you're familiar with the dark web, this is the kind of um, stuff where a lot of the uh, really bad, bad things happen, uh, kind of things get resold. Uh, you can also get Netflix accounts there. Uh, here's one here. There's a bunch of different markets on, on the dark web. And on the dark web, like, you can't really do takedowns. It's not, not really how it works. Uh, people are not going to respond to your requests for removing entries. So what we do instead is we, we try to monitor what's going on. We try to understand what's going on. So what, how much are accounts selling for? Who are the resellers? What are the marketplaces? What's the overall supply? And then we occasionally will do controlled purchases of some of those accounts so we can understand what are the origins. How did they actually get compromised? And then take any intelligence we can get from there and sort of upstream that earlier in the process to other controls. Uh, so I think we have a few minutes. If anybody has questions, happy to. Yes. Uh, it's a nice talk. Uh, thank you. So uh, my question is about this, um, um, like, um, credential staffing. So uh, you mentioned you also look into the dark webs. And so my, my question is, do you, um, like, what's your practice, best practice to avoid any legal consequences? Um, because you buy or you download stuff, then the bit is on your hardware and is uh, kind of tricky. You have to also maybe deal with, is that you who hacked actually somebody? Uh, so like what's your best practice and recommendation for that? Thank oh, you. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So specifically on the dark web in terms of operating there, uh, a general best practice, um, you, you want to be pretty careful. I, I wouldn't recommend folks kind of go out and just pursue that. Uh, there are a number of different firms that can assist you. They will help with doing things like developing personas that can operate in those forums. So just to be clear, we don't actually go onto the dark web and sort of try to hack anybody. It's really more of like observation and understanding what's happening. So a controlled purchase is when we would engage with a vendor to actually procure some of those. And we'll generally do that through a third party. Uh, because there's a, there's a fair amount of work to be done to sort of make sure that uh, you're not exposed. So. Oh, yes. Um, so if you detect a, a, a compromised account, you can send a, a member the pa reset password. Um, they can get, they can regain control. What do you do if it's the email account that was compromised? And if you send a reset password, the attacker gets that. 
Uh, so, so you're saying a member, a user has had their, their, like their, their email account has been compromised and then from there they compromise. Yeah. Their, yeah. That's, that's a, a problem that's relatively difficult to, for us to deal with if, because we're really using uh, the email address as kind of the basis for identity. Sometimes we also accept like, for example, a mobile phone number. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, uh, sometimes how those will result in is, is a customer is going to need to call in directly and get more manual support. Hi. Uh, as you explained that uh, for Netflix, the problem is more of abuse or attack than the spam in the UGC sense, the user-generated content. Uh, what is uh, what happens if the content for very the very content that people come to Netflix for the movies and the they get uploaded to some sites like YouTube or something? I mean, this is from the infrastructure side of things that you're fighting. Yeah. What, what from the content, which is the real core business? Sure. Yeah, so that's that's um, not uncommon either. And the, the problem there is uh, if somebody were to take content from the service and then, you know, upload it to like a pirate site or something like that. So yeah, that's the way that that's handled is a little bit different. It kind of depends on who holds the copyright for that. So some of the stuff we own, uh, some of the the responsibility is really on the content owner. So we do we do process a fair amount of kind of takedowns because of uh, content violations. Great talk. Oh, so how do you handle situations where um, stolen credit cards are being used and they haven't yet been flagged at the service providers? Um, so when stolen credit cards are used, um, we, we do see some of that. So basically, you, you have a stolen credit card number. You come to sign up for Netflix. You get an account. Um, what, we're, what we try to do is, again, that kind of post-sign-up behavior so that because we're not going to charge the card until that, that sort of 30th day. So we do all we can to make sure that we can catch it by then before it gets before it actually we actually make that charge. And so the same kind of things in terms of uh, post sign up analysis. I think it's um, you know there are problems around, for example, card running where people have a, a batch of stolen cards and they'll test the service. So we have a number of different controls around things like rate limiting and other kind of business rules to prevent that kind of mass um, testing of credit cards. Okay, thanks. Hey, so my aspect. Question is kind of orth orthogonal to what you uh, discussed. So, have you seen cases where production houses are using the comp compromised accounts to make their content viral on Netflix, where the production houses kind of ask users to kind of view my suppose they are doing a very very generic queries like action movies, and they come down and open their their movie so that that movie becomes viral in 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 that market, and then production houses are kind of bumping up there. Oh, um, exactly. yeah, gaming the reputation system. Um, that's, uh, yeah, no, that's an interesting, uh, I, I don't know that we see a ton of that. We actually uh, don't make public the uh, viewing hours, for example, of, of a particular title. So it would be, uh, it, would, it would require a fair amount of internal knowledge about how we measure viewership. Uh, we have a reasonably sophisticated model about how we detect you know, if someone's actually viewing content and then how that goes into various um, sort of efficiency models. So, yeah, I don't know that there's a direct um, mechanism that somebody would exploit. I mean, they could potentially internally throw things off, but it would be difficult to sort of externally influence. Uh, yeah, so it seems like a lot of these um, cases that you went through uh, could be diminished by having something like two-factor authentication. Uh, does Netflix employ anything like that? And um, if if you guys don't like, what's the reason behind it? Yeah. So two-factor authentication, uh, we don't have two-factor authentication. We do have things like um, uh, kind of mobile account recovery, or excuse me, account recovery via SMS. Um, so two-factor authentication is it's. I mean, I think we would all agree it's a good control. Um, at you know, ultimately, on many consumer services, people are not really willing to sort of do that. So I would say. Long term, it could be something that we would look into. Um, from what I've heard kind of um, anecdotally on other large consumer services, the uptake is relatively low. Um, I think even on, on uh, you know, like email providers, it's not, not as high as we would like it. But I think, I think over time, I, I, as, as more and more of the general public become comfortable with it, I would imagine it's going to become more popular. Um, thanks for sharing uh, the insights about account takeover sure. and uh, you know the impact to the business. I was just curious: is that a problem of a you know point oh oh one percent scale in terms of accounts, or you know one percent or more kind of a scale? Uh, 
Uh, that's probably wouldn't wouldn't get into specifics, but okay. it's uh, you know it's it's definitely a concern that we that we keep an eye on. I would say at this point we feel like we have it um, we have a reasonable sense of the problem and, and, and sort of where it fits into the overall business. All right, thanks. Hi, uh, what you mentioned is more of a react proactive ways of fighting spam. Are there any reactive ways that you actively look forward or like? As you said, logout is a very clear signal. Uh, I assume uh, changing credentials like e emails, phone numbers is also a very clear signal. So, so the question is if two friends are sharing an account, th that probably is legitimate. But if a hacker is logging silently and trying to stream some content off, that is bad. How do you distinguish between these things? And yeah, that's where I was kind of getting into. So the, 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 I think our initial set, I think we had about 49 or 50 different kind of signals that were, you know, you can never be completely sure, uh, but we had a reasonable model that includes things, for example, changing email, like people very infrequently change their email on their Netflix account. So when we see that, that oftentimes signals some kind of problem. Uh, there's other examples um, would be uh, maybe you're, you've mostly watched uh, content in English and then all of a sudden you change that to, you know, some other language. So those are the kind of signals that we tend to look for. I think we're about out of time. But I, Thanks, everybody. Good question.